Thanks, Jim. I want to thank Jim uh, for making this possible, my visit here possible to Michigan. Uh, my wife and I always like to come to this state. And uh, I also want to thank the uh, uh, Hohenstein Center for uh, agreeing to host this particular lecture. Uh, this is a great honor for me, and I appreciate all the work that has gone in to make this uh, possible. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the James Madison as our uh, a war president. Um, even though we're a democracy, and uh, we uh, like to think that the people uh, run this country, uh, a surprisingly number of great figures are associated with our wars. Washington was the indispensable man in the Revolution. Lincoln strides like a colossus over the uh, Civil War, at least in our historical memory. And we associate both uh, Woodrow Wilson and FDR with the two world wars. Even if you move down to secondary wars, you'll find some dominant figures. Uh, the Mexican War is often called Mr. Polk's War. Uh, LBJ was certainly uh, responsible for the war in Vietnam more than anybody else, and indeed micromanaged that war. And more recently, I think we might call the war in Iraq uh, Bush's War. It doesn't always work that way. Um, I think we went to war in 1898 against Spain uh, in spite of, rather than because of, William McKinley. Um, he was uh, decidedly uh, uh, a reluctant warrior. To a lesser extent, I think James Madison was a reluctant warrior in 1812, although he did his part to bring on this war. Shortly after the United States declared war, a Massachusetts Federalist named John Lowell Jr. published a 60-page pamphlet called Mr. Madison's War, basically trying to hang this war on Madison and accusing him of being uh, um, uh, uh, under French influence, that we essentially went to war uh, to further French interest. Um, this label never caught on. Uh, by and large, we do not refer to this war today as Mr. Madison's War. A few scholars have, but the label didn't catch on at the time, and it hasn't caught on among historians. And I, I want to try to explain today why that didn't happen. And to uh, understand this, I think we have to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Madison's background, what kind of person he was, uh, where he came from, and what his strengths and weaknesses were. He was born into the Virginia aristocracy in 1751. Uh, interestingly, and I think importantly, he did not attend William and Mary like so many of his contemporaries. His health was frail, and so instead his parents sent him to the College of New Jersey, which is now uh, Princeton. Uh, where the, uh, the uh, uh, climate was considered a little more favorable. Uh, he was only five feet four inches tall and thus was uh, known, at least among his enemies, as Little Jemmy or Little Jimmy. Uh, uh, throughout his life, he was shy, cautious, and scholarly, and apparently not very good with women. He did not marry until he was uh, 43 years old, but the result was probably the greatest presidential marriage in our history. He married Dolly Payne, who uh, virtually invented the role of the first lady and served as sort of his rock uh, in his own lifetime, in his own life during his presidency and indeed all of his public service. Uh, and interestingly, he worked with both Jefferson and, and Hamilton in the 1780s. Jefferson to democratize Virginia and Hamilton to try to create a stronger central government. His finest hour was undoubtedly at the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention in 1787. It is with good reason that we call Madison the father of the Constitution. He really did yeoman work there. And then he was largely responsible for the first 10 amendments adopted in the early 1790s, the Bill of Rights. However, neither uh, 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 Madison, who served in the first House of Representatives, or his buddy and fellow Virginian Jefferson, who was in the cabinet, were happy with the direction of the government in the early 1790s. Uh, their perception was that uh, uh, in Jefferson's differences with Hamilton, Washington usually sided with Hamilton, and I think that's correct. So Jefferson resigned from the cabinet in 1793, and he and Madison launched an opposition party, the party that uh, uh, became the, uh, what was then called the Republican Party. It is the forerunner of our modern Democratic Party. The Jeffersonian Republicans won the elections of 1800. Jefferson became president, and he named Madison as his Secretary of State. So Madison served eight, eight years as Secretary of State. And that is probably the job he held 
in which he was most comfortable, as we'll uh, uh, see in a minute. However, he did succeed Jefferson in the presidency. He was the third and last member uh, uh, of the Virginia dynasty, serving as president from 189 to 1817. He was known as the last of the founders because he survived to the uh, age of 85, uh, didn't die until 1836, spent his last years um, mainly working on his reputation and doing things like modifying his earlier letters so it would look like he had a little better view on things than maybe he did at the time. And also, like uh, many of uh, uh, the founders, he had to wrestle with uh, declining uh, finances. That was uh, Jefferson's problem, too. By the time Jefferson died in 18. Uh, 26, he was owned lock, sock, and barrel by the Bank of Richmond. Uh, Madison uh, 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 had a re the responsibility of overseeing our foreign policy essentially throughout the age of Jefferson. The French Revolution had erupted in 1789. It precipitated a general European war, a series of wars, the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, which lasted from 1792 or 93 with Great Britain until 1815. This was the final round of wars that Great Britain and France waged between 1689 and 1815, sometimes called the Second Hundred Years' War, which is, I think, an apt characterization. Uh, essentially, these two nations were duking it out to determine which would be the dominant power in Europe and the wider world. And increasingly, their contest was not limited to Europe or the waters around it. And that was certainly true of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Essentially, this was an ongoing worldwide contest. And as a rising power, the United States found that our rights were frequently uh, infringed upon. Uh, we got caught in the middle of that European war with our far-flung commerce. And I would argue from 1793, when Great Britain entered the war, until 1815, the central problem that American policymakers had to grapple with, and it seems to me this uh, overshadowed all others. And this would have been true for the Federalists in the 1790s as well as for the Jeffersonian Republicans eight, after 1801, and that was this. How could a second-rate power protect its rights and promote its interest in a world at war? That, my friends, was, I think, the million-dollar question. I used to tell my students that was a $64,000 question. They didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, I think maybe this audience will. Uh, uh, that was a central problem, I think, that American policymakers had to grapple with throughout this period. Now, as a Jefferson Secretary of State from 1801 to 1809, Madison frequently found himself confronting uh, uh, these foreign policy issues. And we get a kind of good example of how he operated in a 200-page document that he crafted in 1806, and it was called An Examination of the British Doctrine. This was, at least that was the short title. It was really a review of a British maritime doctrine, not part of international law, but simply a rule the British uh, invented in 1756 to, to uh, make sure they could maximize the use of their naval power in time of war. The rule of 1756 held that trade close to a neutral power in time of peace could not be open to neutrals in time of war. And it was simply designed to ensure that Britain's enemies did not use neutral traders to conduct their commerce after their own ships had been driven from the high seas by the Royal Navy. So Madison writes this just wonderful uh, uh, scholarly treatise uh, exploring this rule and uh, concluding that it had no standing at all in international law. As a scholarly treatise, it's absolutely wonderful, but it's tif typical, Mad a Mad a typical Mad Madisonian document. It, it provides for, it makes no recommendations on how we ought to deal with this problem, uh, how we ought to confront the British. And this is Madison as a scholar, and I think probably the typical uh, Madison. The Jeffersonian Republicans opted to try to defend our rights with a series of trade restrictions between 18, adopted between 1806 and 1811. The best known is the notorious uh, Long Embargo, which was in force from December of 1807 to March of uh, 1809. It was an abject failure. It destroyed American prosperity and cut sharply into government revenue. 
But even though the Republicans repeal that measure, they adopted uh, another trade restriction in its wake and then another one after that. Uh, the Republicans were deathly, deathly afraid of war because it seemed to Jefferson and Madison and their followers that it would transform the American Republic into some kind of uh, European state. Uh, everything they hated about the great powers of Europe seemed to be caused in their eyes by uh, monarchy and warfare. You go to war, you end up with big bloated government, you've got big armies, you've got big navies, you've got uh, uh, fat uh, contractors, you've got corruption, and the very Republican experiment they, experiment they believed would be at risk. And so they were eager to avoid war, and that's why they opted for trade restrictions, even though they did not work. But such was their reputation for uh, avoiding war that uh, Josiah Quincy, another Massachusetts Federalist in 1809, claimed that the Republican majority could not be kicked into war. That is a quote. And to further uh, quote him, no insult, he said, offered to us by either Britain or by either France or Great Britain could force this majority, he was speaking of the majority in Congress, into a declaration of war and nothing in the years that followed changed his view. Even after the War Congress had convened in late 1811, Josiah Quincy wrote that all the talk of war was ludicrous and that even the highest tone of the war party conceded to him privately that war was unlikely. Well, that was a widely held view even among Republicans in late 1811. President Madison, however, did his part to bring on the war. First of all, he summoned the War Congress, or what came to be known as the War Congress, this was the 12th Congress, to an early meeting in November of uh, 1811. And then in his opening address to that uh, Congress, delivered on November 5th, the day after Congress convened, uh, Madison uh, referred to Britain's hostile inflexibility and recommended that Congress put the nation into an armor and an attitude demanded on, by the crisis. In other words, he recommended that Congress adopt war preparations. That was done. Much of the work, I think, was done by the Speaker of the House, young Henry Clay, who was the leading war hawk. And uh, by the way, he was a first-term congressman, elected to the ceremonial position of Speaker of the House, and subsequently transformed that ceremonial position into a real position of power. He packed the key committees with war hawks, he directed debate, he interpreted the rules, and in general kept recalcitrant uh, members in line. So I think probably more than anybody else, he was responsible for the war movement in Congress. And in the process, he really create, created the modern position of the Speaker of the House. Well, the second uh, uh, address that Madison gave to uh, uh, further uh, the war program was a short speech delivered on, to Congress on March 9th when he presented the papers of a British sky, spy named John Henry to Congress. Uh, purportedly, these uh, papers showed that the British had been trying to disrupt the Union by sending a special agent to New England in 1808 and 1809. And I, Madison's hope was this would sort of stimulate the war uh, spirit. Didn't work out that way, it turned out there wasn't much damaging in Henry's letters. Uh, mostly it was an intelligence gathering operation, which all governments engage in at the time you know, whenever there was tension with a foreign nation. Uh, uh, Henry didn't mention any names, nor did he even really indicate that uh, Massachusetts or any other New England state was ripe for uh, disunion. And what really infuriated the Federalists was they discovered in sharp contrast to Henry's covering letter, which suggested he was just donating these papers to the U.S. government, uh, the Madison administration had uh, forked out 50 grand, which was the entire Secret Service budget, and the kind of money that could have built you a small ship of war in those days. Well, it didn't work out, but nevertheless, that was Madison's attempt to try to stimulate support for the war effort. Uh, the final step he took, and this was in the form of another address sent to Congress, was what we call his war message. It was submitted to Congress on December, or rather January 1st, 1812. Uh, in that letter, he laid out, uh, presented essentially an indictment of the British 
for encroaching on our, our trade with the uh, orders in consul, a series of executive orders that restricted our trade with the continent of Europe, um, for impressing American seamen, that is to say, removing seamen from American merchant vessels to fill out the crews of the Royal Navy, for violating our territorial waters, and for engaging in other acts that he uh, insisted uh, violated our rights and encroached upon our sovereignty. His concluding remark was, behold, on the side of Great Britain, we, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. We behold on the side of Great Britain a state of war against us, the, Uni uh, the United States, on the side of the United States, a, pa uh, a state of peace against Great Britain. Now, two interesting observations about this war message. Madison did not ask for a declaration of war. This was partly because he wanted to avoid the charge of executive influence, and it was partly because uh, he was one of the uh, authors of the Constitution, and he knew the decision rested with Congress. But his message was clear. His recommendation was certainly there, if not overt. And what I find really interesting about this letter, or this message, and I didn't discover this until I reread it recently after a number of years, is that it, there is a real powerful undercurrent of anger in this message, which I haven't seen in any other address, any other letter that Madison ever wrote. And I, right after I reread that, I read the congressional message, the congressional report recommending war. This came out of the House of Representatives, it was crafted by John C. Calhoun, the South Carolina Republican, who was then an ardent nationalist and a very strong war hawk. And I would say uh, Calhoun's uh, House of Representatives report doesn't show quite the same anger that Madison's war message does. So this, it seems to me, shows an uncharacteristic side of Madison. Now, I still think Madison was a step behind Henry Clay and the War Hawks in trying to promote uh, a declaration of war on the part of the United States. But you can't accuse him of not doing his part as president. Uh, we have several uh, interesting documents from Madison which show his state of mind right after the declaration of war. First of all, on the 19th of June, that was the day after he signed the war bill into war, he issued a proclamation uh, proclaiming a state of war. And a lot of scholars have assumed that the war dates from the 19th because of that proclamation. That's another myth on the War of 1812. Um, uh, the, we, went, we, we were in a state of war the moment Madison signed the war bill from Congress, and that was the day before. Anyway, Madison issued that proclamation, and he also received a visit, visit from the British minister, the equivalent of an ambassador. It's not quite the same status. Uh, we had no ambassadors in those days. We had uh, U.S. ministers that were the ranking diplomats that we sent to the great powers of Europe, and they reciprocated. Anyway, the British minister to Washington was a guy named August, Augustus J. Foster, and he visited Madison on the 19th to take his leave. Um, he was now persona non, uh, persona non grata and was going to be going up to Halifax and then back uh, to England. And he reported when he arrived to meet with the president that there were a number of Republicans there from Congress and they were all celebrating. They were shaking hands, smiling, joking, back slapping, but not Madison. He reported that, but the president was white as a sheep, a sheet and very naturally felt all the responsibilities he would, in, he would incur. So Madison clearly was not someone who welcomed this declaration, well, at least welcomed the responsibility. He was smart enough to know that there were a, a, a lot of things that you could not predict that would happen once you were at war. And at least according, according to Foster, he just didn't look like a happy camper. All right, the day after that, uh, Richard Rush, I think I put on in your notes that it was your little outline that it was Benjamin Rush. He's the great Philadelphia uh, uh, doctor. This was his son, Richard Russ, Rush, who later became Attorney General. He visited Madison and uh, uh, he reported uh, as follows. Uh, Madison visited in person, a thing never known before, all the offices of the Departments of War and the Navy stimulating everything in a manner worthy of the little commander-in-chief with his little round hat and a huge cockade. Cockade is a ribbon or a badge. So here's, this is a sympathetic observer saying here's this little guy in this big hat 
going around to the uh, departments trying to stimulate enthusiasm for the war. And there is something, if not slightly ridiculous here, at least uh, uh, it doesn't suggest that Madison cut a very uh, impressive figure as a war leader. The third thing I want to point out about Madison shortly after the declaration of war is that he didn't wait very long to send out peace feelers. Uh, within a week of the declaration of war, he used various channels to alert the British upon what terms we were willing to make peace. The British were going to have to give up the orders in council, as it turned out they repealed them about the same time we went to war, and they were going to have to give up impressment. Now, Madison was not alone here in thinking that it was possible to win a war without fighting it. This was a common view among leading Republicans, and you can see this in their letters to one another. Uh, the view was the British were not taking us seriously, and if only we declared war, that would bring them to their senses. They would see how angry and upset we were, and they would make concessions on these uh, issues that uh, uh, divided the two nations. The British, by the way, found this all very, very puzzling. Um, uh, in their view, we were missing an important step in the sequence of events one would expect in circumstances like this. Number one, the United States had declared war. Number three, the United States has a had asked the British if they wanted to make peace, but the United States hadn't bothered with number two, which was to win the war. The British were accustomed to asking nations for terms only after they had defeated them on the battlefield. And you find the British Foreign Secretary, Castlereagh, a little bit puzzled by these uh, peace feelers and saying, well, if the Americans are unhappy with the declaration of war, they can certainly revoke it. Uh, the subtext being, but if they want us to make concessions, they're going to have to find a way to put pressure on us. All right, that's Madison uh, right before and right after the declaration of war. I want to go into now Madison's role uh, during the war. Um, and here it seems to me he had trouble at all levels with his cabinet, with Congress, and with the American people. His cabinet was filled by people who were incompetent and who were given to intrigue, backbiting, and outright disloyalty. Madison was not master of his own house. Now he was saddled at the beginning of the war by a very weak Secretary of War, William Eustis, uh, this guy just not was up to the job. It was a really tough job, by the way, managing the War Department, even in time of peace. In time of war, it was a nightmare, and it scared other people who might have been able to do it away. This guy was just beyond his depth, and those who knew him said he spent his time reading petty newspaper ads to see where he could buy a dozen shoes or a dozen hats to outfit the large army that we were uh, uh, building. Uh, he finally, uh, Madison finally asked him to resign about six months in the war. He was replaced by another figure, a New Yorker, John Armstrong. He was a lot better, good judge of talent, but given to laziness and given to intrigue. He had a real talent for intrigue. Uh, to give you one example, uh, uh, a Pennsylvanian had drawn up a new uh, tactical uh, doctrinal manual. He sent it out to the generals, asked them what they thought. They all gave it the thumbs down. And he wrote back to uh, William Duane, uh, the author, and said, well, a lot of criticism is your, your manual. Let me tell you what each person said, uh, which would ensure that uh, Duane uh, would look to Armstrong rather than to any of the generals when he wanted something. Um, uh, Madison was no better served, at least initially, by his Secretary of the Navy. This was Paul Hamilton, a South Carolina planter who was said to often be drunk by, by noon, uh, an alcoholic. Um, in fact, uh, another Republican, North Carolinian, uh, Nathaniel Macon, commented in early 1812 that Hamilton was about as fit for his office as the Indian prophet would be uh, uh, to serve as emperor of Europe. Um, uh, Madison kept him around for about 16 months, before finally forcing him to resign. He was replaced by William Jones, who was a Philadelphia merchant, and he was very good. He did a great job as Secretary of the Navy. Monroe was Secretary of State, later Secretary of War, did a decent job in both uh, uh, cabinet positions, but there was one problem with Monroe. He had his eyes on the presidency. And time and time again, you see him maneuvering to make sure that someone like Armstrong doesn't get credit that might make him a better candidate. And at one point, he maneuvered to try to be, get a senior command in the field, 
so that he'd outrank everybody, could make his reputation in the field, and stride into the presidency the way George Washington had. Well, that didn't happen, but uh, that did color, uh, I think, Monroe's uh, 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 decisions as first Secretary of State and then Secretary of War. And by the way, as Secretary of State, he went out and examined the, uh, uh, the way the American troops were laid out when the British threatened Washington, D.C., redeployed the troops so that the second line could not deforce the first, which made it a lot easier for the British to overrun both lines. And the upshot was the public buildings in Washington got burned. Madison never took any heat for that, but he should have. He had no authority in the matter, and yet here he was monkeying with the deployment of uh, soldiers in the field and greatly weakening the, uh, the deployment. Um, Madison was well served by his Secretary of uh, the Treasury. That was Albert Gall Gallatin. He was very good, but he had a lot of enemies in Congress, and he finally fled to Europe as a member of the peace delegation in 1813. He was succeeded by a guy named George W. Candle, uh, Campbell, who probably could not have balanced his own checkbook if he had had one. He was wholly beyond his depth as Secretary of the Treasury. They finally got another good one at the tail end of the war, uh, Alexander uh, Dallas from uh, uh, Philadelphia, uh, but uh, by then uh, uh, the nation's uh, public finances are, had already collapsed. Now perhaps worst of all was a Postmaster General, Gideon G Granger. This guy had held that position since 1801, um, and by 1812 he was open, openly working for the defeat of Madison for re-election, and handing out post postmasterships and assistant postmasterships to all the enemies of the administration. Uh, Madison did not, however, finally get rid of him till 1814, when he refused to put an enemy of the administration in the critical position as postmaster uh, general in Philadelphia. And by the way, in those days, postmasters in major cities thought nothing of reading the mail that came through their hands. And the, the merchants in Philadelphia said they weren't going to send any money through that mail. And other Republicans from Philadelphia said they weren't going to use the mails at all if this guy was going to be reading their mail. So Madison finally got rid of him. Uh, all in all, though, I don't think he was particularly well served by his cabinet. And he was slow to get rid of those who were not serving him well. He didn't have much better luck with Congress. Uh, he was never able to rid the, uh, 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 either the House or the Senate of the factions uh, that tore the Republican Party apart. Uh, the Federalists only controlled about 30 to 35 percent of the seats in both houses of Congress. You could count on them to oppose administration initiatives during the war. The problem with Madison was he could not keep uh, all the Republican factions in line, and time and time again they simply ignored or refused to carry out uh, his recommendations. Even before the war, he recommended that the Army, which was 10,000 strong, at least on paper, be expanded to 15, uh, that we had another 15,000 of three-year men. Well, and said Congress uh, uh, passed a bill that created a 25,000-man army uh, of five-year men, and that army was a lot harder to recruit. Madison also wanted 50,000 volunteers who'd be ready for service immediately. Congress gave him those 50,000 volunteers, but said the states would appoint the officers. None of the states did. So this was a dead force in the early phase of the war, and it never really amounted to much uh, uh, during the war. Madison also had trouble with public finance. He wanted Congress to uh, sanction the adoption of internal taxes, the very ta taxes that had helped bring down the Federalists in 1800, and House Republicans were dead set against that. They refused to adopt the necessary taxes until a, a, a year into the law, uh, war. They didn't go into effect until six months later, and the upshot of this was in the summer of 1814, public finance collapsed. The government tried to borrow money and could not, could not fulfill its war loans. That, its financial problems was uh, compounded by the suspension of specie payments outside of New England. In those days, banks issued their own notes, which they were supposed to redeem in gold and silver. But in August of 1814, there were a run on the banks because of the British invasion of Washington. And by the time the dust had cleared, all the banks in the middle and southern and western states would no longer redeem their own notes. Now, these problems made it impossible for the government to meet its obligations or to move money around the country. 
And the upshot of this was the United States government for the only time since Hamilton put our finances on a sound footing in the 1790s actually defaulted on the national debt in 1814. It could not meet the quarterly interest payments, which by law had to be paid in gold or silver. So it defaulted. Now, ironically, it did not default on overseas bondholders because uh, our international bank at the ho banker at the time was the House of Bering in London. And without the British government protesting very much, uh, the House of Bering advanced the US government the necessary funds so that foreign bondholders got paid. So it shows you what a, a, a sharp line there was between public and private business in the early 19th century. Uh, Madison also had trouble getting Congress to adopt the trade restrictions he wanted. He never lost his faith in, the tra in, in trade restrictions. I consider him the chief ar architect of the restrictive system before the war, and he was constantly uh, 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 asking Congress for more restrictions, either to restrict trade with the enemy so that the British couldn't uh, secure American food and other supplies, and also to put economic pressure on Great Britain, and Congress was pretty reluctant to comply with the president's request. And finally, Madison didn't do very well stimulating the, the nation. Uh, Federalists were dead set against this war. They weren't going to subscribe to the war loans or enlist in the Army or Navy. And Republicans didn't seem very enthusiastic either. They seemed to support this war more with their heads than their hearts and more with their hearts and their purses. And the upshot of this was uh, we had trouble not only raising uh, money to support the war with the war loans, but also trouble filling the ranks of the, uh, the US Army. In the end, the government had to keep jacking up the bounty. By the end of the war, uh, someone willing to enlist in the Army was offered uh, $124 in cash and 320 acres of land. That would be based on what the average unskilled laborer made in those days, probably about 30 grand today. So this was a handsome uh, bounty indeed. Uh, but that's what we had to do to get we, the, the men we needed. A couple of areas where I think Madison did look pretty good was first of all his treatment of uh, prisoners of war and enemy aliens, and secondly, his treatment of Federalist opponents. Early in the war, his attorney general, William Pinckney, and a member of the Supreme Court, the great Joseph Story, recommended that the administration ask Congress for a Sedition Act to punish and silence opponents of the war. To his credit, Madison refused to do that. Uh, 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 however, uh, a Republican mob sometimes took matters in their own uh, hands, and there was a series of vicious rights, uh, riots in Philadelphia to silence the Federalists there. By the way, when the rioters in the third riots threatened the US Post Office, an express rider raced from Baltimore to Washington to alert the president that the post office was uh, under siege. And he, his reply, and we have this in writing, this isn't hearsay, was that while he conceded that the post office was under the sanction of the United States, he doubted that any defensive measures were within the executive sphere. That seems to me to be an odd line of reasoning. Um, Madison, throughout the war, had to contend with Federalist opposition. And by the way, in later years, he repeatedly said that uh, Federalist opposition was the worst uh, thing he had to deal with during the war, the thing that undermined the war effort the, the most, especially in New England. Uh, William Wirt, who visited him in 1814, reported that he was miserably shattered and woe be gone. His mind seems full of the New England revolt. He introduced the subject and continued to press it, painful it is, as it obviously was to him. Well, to his credit, though, Madison, like other war presidents, did not use the powers of the government to try to silence those who opposed his war. And, and for my money, that really shows Madison at his best during the War of 1812. Uh, uh, an understanding that if he truly believes in uh, freedom of the press, he's got to allow it to his enemies as well as his friends. All right, uh, by way of conclusion, I want to give you five quotations on Madison's war, war leadership, all made by Republicans who supported the administration. Uh, the first comes from John C. Calhoun, the South Carolina war hawk in early 1812. Our president, he said, has not those commanding talents 
which are necessary to control those about him. Then in late 1812, the Richmond Inquirer, this is a Republican newspaper in uh, uh, Virginia, probably the closest thing to a hometown newspaper that Madison had. Madison said the newspaper was too tender of the feelings of other people. That was in late 1812. Early 1813, William A. Burrell, a Republican supporter of the administration in Washington, a Virginian, fellow Virginian said, the um, uh, am amiable temper and delicate sensibility of Mr. Madison are the real sources of our embarrassments. And then in uh, 1814, uh, a, a Pennsylvania Republican, Charles J. Ingersoll, reported of the president, his spirit and capacity for a crisis are very generally called into question. And finally, an unnamed uh, Kentucky congressman wrote to the Lexington Reporter in early 1815, Mr. Madison is perhaps too good a man for the responsible office he holds. He does not like to offend his fellow men for any cause. Now, this was the perception of Matt Madison's allies. So even if you argue that none of this is true, it suggests that he wasn't a very effective wartime president. He was a good man and he was a great statesman, but that doesn't mean he was a great president and it certainly doesn't mean he was a great wartime president. I think if you're going to judge someone's presidency, you can look at the whole presidency and make your assessment. And then if you're going to decide whether someone is a good war president, you've got to zero in on the war years. Uh, I think the common mistake that historians make is that they think if someone was a good statesman, he had to be a good president. Jefferson gets a real pass on this score. Uh, Madison less so. Jefferson had a great first term. His second term was an utter disaster. But you ask anybody if he was a good president, they'll say he was. They'll say, of course he was. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Well, what's that got to do with his presidency? Or he founded the University of Virginia. Uh, or, you know, launched Lewis and Clark, the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Those were all in his first term. Second term was a disaster. So uh, I think in assessing these presidents, these wartime presidents, we may decide they were good statesmen. We may even decide they were good presidents. But that doesn't necessarily mean they were good war presidents.